morning. It is Sunday, July 12, 2020. And I'm Pastor Mark Dilley of West Valley Grace Fellowship in Sun City West, Arizona. I pray the message this morning will, will be used to strengthen you in your faith and encourage you in your walk with our Savior and Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so let's begin this morning with opening our Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, beginning with verse 9. And again, it is on the handouts. If you have a handout, it's right there. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Let's pray. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with overwhelming thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for the riches of your grace and for the great salvation that you have given us in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we bow before you as our sovereign God and our Creator, and we thank you for having opened our hearts and our eyes to the truth of the gospel of salvation and having trusted your sinless Son as our Savior we have received the gift of eternal life and a future with you in heaven for all eternity. And it's all been in accordance with your will and purpose to the praise of your glorious grace. And so, Lord, it's our heart's desire as your children and with your spirit living in us that we would live faithful lives worthy of our calling. And so that is our heart's desire to know you and to serve you all the days of our life. And so we commit this time and this message to that end, that you might glorify yourself through your word and in us. And we give you all the thanks and the praise forever and ever. For it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Last week I talked about walking by faith and not by sight. And I would like to expand that thought this morning concerning the object of our faith. You know, we trust in a lot of things in this life. When I got up this morning, I trusted that the air conditioning would still be working. I trusted that when I get up and I'm going to go to church, my car is going to start. We have all kinds of faith. The sad truth of the matter is, many, many times, our faith will be placed in something that's not going to be able to uphold our confidence in it. Uh, my wife and I used to uh, sort of, I guess you could all make fun of our children. Every spring, they would have school, uh, we used to call them annuals, but that was outdated, and now they have yearbooks, I guess. 
And uh, anyway, we would, uh, I don't know whether we were violating their privacy or something, but we would go through and read the comments everybody wrote in them. And oftentimes, uh, bring it up to our children that, oh, I'll be there forever for you. Or if you ever have a problem, I'll always be there. And now our children have almost zero contact, personally, physical contact with any of those people. And, and I thought maybe our, our own feelings were a little hurt, that our children didn't think that we would always be there or something, that their friends, you know, at that stage, they're very wise and knowing all things. And, but uh, we even bring it up yet today that what well, we're still here for you. And uh, so the object of our faith, is it something that deserves that faith? Can we trust it? And I am totally so thankful for my faith, especially as, it, uh, as the day we live in. I'm going to make a confession again, but this world is a joke. That's my opinion. It is just laughable. And I'm so thankful that I've got something that I could just put all my eggs in this basket and let that world go to hell in a handbag. I don't care. I'm not going to change it. They are committed to their end. They are committed to their purposes of which I don't care about or agree with at all. And it just is becoming laughable. Now, it doesn't mean that I am indifferent to the plight of others. And I'm not indifferent to uh, the struggles that the Native Americans, if we can call them that, the, the American Indians, uh, the, the struggles they went through because of what is now called white privilege, and then the struggles of the, the, the blacks, and slavery and all of that and the ramifications that are still being reverberating in today's society, all that stuff, I think it's been terrible the way human beings treat other human beings. And it's really not so much about race. It's just about the nature of human beings. And so we can trust in a multitude of things in this life, but there is only one object of faith that will never fail. It is the God of scriptures. It is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the God of the Bible the Father of Jesus Christ. And so, uh, I'm just going to make this statement. There is one eternal, self-existent God who exists in three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now, this is where, uh, and we're going to talk about it here, but this is where man's knowledge, man's wisdom, man's insights can't really grasp. There is one God, and yet there is God the Father, there is God the Son, there is God the Spirit. They are not three gods. They all are God in one. And that's a little hard for our minds to wrap around. And so it, the three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And you, can, you have the resources or the references to that concept. But with the fall of mankind, or with the fall of Adam, with Adam's sin and the fall of mankind, mankind being dead, in transgressions and sins has been blinded and deceived. Now again, we can say that as members 
of the church, the body of Christ today, having the Spirit of God living in us. I have no question or no doubt about that statement. That man is deceived. He is blinded. But to a lot of people, that's a very offensive statement. To the wise of this world, they've come up with all kinds of solutions and answers for all of man's problems. And we can see where it has gotten us today. But in all of that, mankind just will not, by their own thought process, come to agree with man is blinded and deceived. But as a result of that condition, if God is to be known, if human beings can know God and be understood, then God must reveal himself to mankind. It doesn't work the other way. You hear a lot of people talking about, oh, he's seeking God. It, the, the Bible says there's none that seek God, no, not one. They may be seeking answers. They may be seeking something. But they're truly not, by their nature, seeking the God of the Bible. And so man won't do that. God must reveal himself, and he has revealed himself. He has made himself known. Both in creation and in his word, God has revealed himself, making known his purpose and will. And in this revelation, he has clearly stated the vast gulf between man's nature, man's intelligence, and man's knowledge compared to his. And so let's look at uh, man's nature first of all. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become. And every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. Man in his lost condition is totally at enmity with God. I have a brother in Christ who tells people that once in a while that if you're not saved, you're an enemy of God. And boy, do the hackles on their neck come up. They really don't want to hear that. But the scriptures make it very clear that because of Adam's sin, man was put in this horrendous position. And then let's look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. Unsaved people today, from whatever religion it may be, regardless of how good, philanthropic, loving, kind they are in the human world, in the present world, they are objects of wrath. And the only deliverance is faith in the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for their sins. Now let's look at God's nature. Isaiah 6, 3, talking about the angels in God's presence. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. You can find numerous occasions where God is declared to be holy. And to be holy is to be perfectly righteous, and just in all things. It, it's totally separate 
from everything else. And then in Psalm 145 and verse 17, the Lord is righteous in all his ways and loving toward all he has made. Here comes another statement, and, and these, again, I would like to express this. What I'm teaching or preaching today is what I believe. If you don't believe that, that's okay. That's between you and God. I'm not telling you, hey, everything I say is right. What I declare is what I believe. What you believe is between you and God, and that's outside of my pay grade or my bailiwick or whatever else. Every person will individually stand before God and give an account. And so there'll be no being like Adam. Remember what Adam's excuse was? It's the woman he gave me. She made me do it. There won't be any of that then. He will bring to light everything and reveal the inner motives. There'll be no excuse making, no yabats or nothing. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, if it, it is beyond the ability of finite natural man to know his infinite creator apart from God making himself known. It isn't a two-way connection as so many people try to make it out. It isn't that if you really look for God, you'll find him. That's not what the scriptures teach, although they do declare that in another dispensation. But at the present time, there's none that really seek God to begin with. And so, if God is to be known, it is him, it is he that has to give the revelation of himself to the natural man. And so, uh, it is through the working of the Spirit of God that God reveals himself, and he has done that both through nature and through his word. But it's the Spirit of God that is the revealer or illuminator of the fallen man's heart so that he can see God, so he can know God, so he can understand God, so he can have God's wisdom. That all comes from the Spirit of God. It is not innate in us. Uh, there's some people that teach there's a little bit of God in all of us or a little bit of good in all of us. And again, that's not supported in Scripture. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and verse 9, begin with verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and verse 9. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. And in verse 10, but God has revealed it to us by his spirit. And now Paul is saying that nobody can really know these things in any way, but God has made them known by his spirit to the believer. That us isn't everybody, the whole human race. It's the believer. And then it goes on to say, the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In other words, we can understand as fellow human beings a lot of the way man thinks, the way man acts, because we have a common spirit. But on the other hand, it goes on to say, in the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. 
We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. That we, and again, this pronoun we is referring to saved people, members of the body of Christ. We may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak. Now Paul's talking about himself, and I pray that I speak similarly. Not in words taught us by human wisdom. In other, not with religious doctrines, not with the commandments of men, not with church polity, not with anything about religion in any way, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. We, I don't think we spend a lot of time thinking about these things, but you're not growing in the knowledge of God because you have more intelligence than somebody else. You're not growing in the knowledge of God because you pray five hours a day and you read the Bible five hours a day and you do God's work five hours a day. If you're growing in the knowledge of God, it is by grace. It is not by works. And if you're growing in the knowledge of God, it is the Spirit of God that is making that knowledge real to you and it is becoming your faith. And now having that faith, you then respond, knowing these things are true, it changes your life. And you start to live in that faith. And so verse 14, 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 14. Now this is what I think is a little bit of a loose translation of what the Greek says. It says here, the man without the spirit. In the King James Version, it says, for the natural man. And a lot of people think of the natural man as the unsaved man. I'm more of the opinion that that's the carnal man. The word here is not sarks, which deals with carnal, but it's sukikos which deals with the soul. And so the soulical man, I believe that can be the unsaved man or even a believer in Christ who is trusting in his own wisdom, trusting in his own pursuits, rather than total dependence on God for what he believes. But anyway, the man without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Again, he doesn't have the Spirit in him, or the Spirit is not convincing this person of these truths, one or the other. And so, Verse 15 goes on to say, the spiritual man, the man who is totally walking and trusting in the Spirit of God, makes judgment about all things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. In other words, Paul says, and I'm going to paraphrase this from another place, he says basically, it matters little if I'm judged by you. And he goes on to say, God is my judge. And he says again, Basically, it makes no matter to me if I'm judged by you. My conscience is clear, yet that doesn't justify me. So in other words, each one of us has to realize, no matter what we believe and how sincerely we believe it, we can still be wrong. And so my only confidence in my faith is to trust God to do it all for me. And that's what he's promised us in the dispensation of grace. But man, in his solical nature, in his fallen nature, however you want to say it, man in his own nature doesn't want that. And so it's a battle between the Spirit of God and that old nature continually in this life. And so Paul is pointing out that 
if we know anything, it's because the Spirit of God has taught us that. And then, remember when uh, God talked to Job? I address this every once in a while. But when God's going to straighten Job out, he starts out by saying something to the effect, Who is this that darkens my counsel without knowledge? And that's basically what our nature always wants to do. Our nature wants to try to figure out God. And the question, more often than not, is why God? That's not fitting in to the way I think you should operate. When something tragic happens in our lives, why me, God? That's not the question that should be asked. If you truly have faith, if you truly believe that God is sovereign, that he works all things together for good, that he works all things after the counsels of his own will, there should be no question as to why. We don't need to know why. What we desire is how or what is my role in this for your glory. And that's what we should desire. And so in Isaiah 55, beginning with verse 8, Isaiah chapter 55, beginning with verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. And that's the confidence that I have. It is nothing. I will not teach you anything. If you learn any spiritual truth, it may come from something I say, but it will be the Spirit of God that gives it to you in truth and convince you of the veracity of it. And when you are convinced of that, you now believe it. And so like Paul says, who is Apollos or who is Paul but ministers of Christ? And he concludes with, he's nothing. We're simply earthen vessels so that all the glory goes to God. So God made himself known to Paul. Paul had spent the majority of his life, well, almost all of his life, growing up in Judaism and pursuing what you might call religious success. His desire was to be the top in the Jewish religion. And he was a following that ladder, really seeming successful in it all. He says, if anybody has something to boast about in the flesh, I more. And he goes through his accomplishments and his desires and all of that. And yet, he didn't know God. And so, God made himself known to Paul on his way to Damascus. God chose Paul to be the person through whom he would make known the revelation of the gospel of the grace of God, which was a mystery or a secret hidden from before creation. Let's look at Galatians chapter 1 in verses 11 and 12. Again, there are a lot of people that are great, recognized as great Bible commentators. And uh, most of the time now, when you buy a book, in the front, there's usually three or four people of some form of renown giving uh, 
what's it called? Uh, testimony. testimony or something uh, promoting the book. So and so does a fantastic job in expounding this or that. Review. Yeah, review. And so, and you hear, I've heard a lot of people say, Paul must have been a brilliant man the way he put the book of Romans together. Well, Paul may have been a brilliant man. Uh, help me out. All men, does it, does it, Constitution, is it say, or is it the Bill of Rights that says all men are created equal? Is that what it says? Declaration of Independence. But anyway, that's not quite true. Yeah. <laughs> all men are created equal in regards to their talents. Uh, some people are more intelligent than others. Some people are better looking than others. But whatever it might be, we're not all the same. We have equal rights. We have equal opportunities we're supposed to have as God's creation, but we're not created equal. God knit each one of us together in our mother's womb. He put us exactly the way he wanted us to be. He made us with our DNA. And there are no two DNAs alike, as I understand it. And so we're not created the same. And so whatever physical, mental, emotional powers or strengths we have that God knitted in us, he put them there for his use, for his glory. And it is our response to submit ourselves to the God that knows the beginning from the end, who is the Alpha and the Omega, it's our response to say, God, you made me for your glory. I trust you to use me for your purpose, which you have created me in Christ Jesus. And trust him instead of trying to figure him out. When I took homiletics, which is the, the art of preaching, they really work on getting... Uh, how to present something so the mind can comprehend it. I've got to listen to this. Don't take it wrong. It's not a nag. But I hear every once in a while, you know, you shouldn't preach more than a half an hour. Because man, <laughs> man can only comprehend so much. But both of those may be true. But I'm not bound by that. The Spirit of God is not bound by how long I preach. The Spirit of God can reveal one thing to you today which nobody else in this audience will even hear. And it will become real to you today. And it may be within the next 45 minutes. No, it's not going to last that long. <laughs> but that's where our faith is not in three real alliterated points. God is good, God is grace, God is whatever. You know, they, we do all kinds of manipulatives and try to get something so our minds can remember them. The Spirit of God doesn't need any of that. What does God want us to do? Preach the truth. And he will make it fit. Have we read that yet? Yeah, my, where he said, my word won't return on me, boy, but it will accomplish that for which I've ordained it. And so it is, it's always amazed me, and I've experienced it not just in my own preaching, but in other audiences, where a person can stand up here and say his half hour's worth of words, and two people can leave hearing opposites. One person will say, well, he doesn't believe in eternal security. The other says, oh, he does too believe in it. And they both heard something to support their way. And a lot of times, we, I've, been, I've sat out there, I've seen, I felt my eyes rolling up into my head like this, and things like that, and I'm going to sleep. And yet the Spirit of God can all of a sudden, something is said and you just sort of hear it for the first time. And then you think, did he really say that? God isn't bound by us. 
He's the one that is communicating to us. And when he wants us to hear it, it will be effective. And that's, what, that's why God is sovereign in all of this. And so Paul got this message. He didn't figure it out. He knew the Jewish scriptures that he lived under all his life. He knew those inside out, I'm sure. And yet he says this in Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 11. I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preached is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. And that's what, if you're saved today, you're saved because the Spirit of God revealed the truth of God into your heart and into your mind. He illumined your eyes to it, you knew it was true, and you believed the gospel. And there was nothing you could do about that. You couldn't, at that point, and this really messes a lot of people up, and they, and they don't have to agree with me, but I believe it with all my heart. You couldn't reject it at that point. You didn't want to reject it at that point because you had been convinced it was true. And you don't want to reject the truth. You may not like it initially, but you believe it. I can remember a good friend of mine when he saw, and this is just one of the things that he saw in his uh, coming to understand the gospel of the grace of God and the revelation of the mystery, when he came to understand that the church didn't begin at Pentecost. He was in a, a group of um, Bible believers, uh, what their faith is, I can't say, but he was in a group of Bible believers that believed the church began at Pentecost and all those speaking in tongues and healing and everything like that was part of today's program. And he believed it with all his heart. And one day he was reading in the book of Acts. And he was just hit. He doesn't know why, but he was just hit. The church couldn't have begun here. And you know what his first reaction was? He said, I got down on my knees and prayed, Lord, take that thought away from me. That can't be true. The church had to begin there. And he said he started praying about that. And he was just convinced. He says, I can't pray. I can't pray against this. I believe it's true. It didn't begin here. And instead, he was the treasurer of that organization. He took his books and everything and took it down to the church that day and said, I can't be treasurer any longer here. And he left the church. He didn't know where he was going or anything. He had previously heard some things about the mystery and the gospel of the grace of God from O'Hare, who was a dynamic preacher of this message, and when he left there, he said, that guy is nuts. He doesn't know anything about Bible truth. And now here, years later, he believes everything that that man was preaching. He believed the same thing. Now that had nothing to do with his desires or anything else. It had to do with the work of the Spirit of God in his life. And so Paul goes on here to say that he didn't earn it. I want you to know, brothers, the gospel is not something that man made up. I didn't receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. And that's what happens to every one of us when our faith is built up by the Spirit of God. I was saved without anybody really teaching or preaching to me even the gospel of salvation. I may have heard it, but I was saved simply by reading the Bible over and over again. And I didn't have any idea what I was doing or what I was looking for. 
I just all of a sudden had a, a sense in my own being that what I had believed for 33 years of my life doesn't make sense, really. I can no longer accept that. Where was that coming from? I wasn't desirous. I was committed to what I had believed. I would have fought for it, maybe even died for it. I don't know. But now all of a sudden, it wasn't right. And I was reading the Bible to, for whatever reason to try to solve my dilemma. And the Spirit of God ultimately showed me that I deserve to go to hell. I am a sinner, and I knew it. And then the Bible also showed me the Spirit of God illumined my heart that Christ was my only hope. And I believed it, and I didn't do that against, oh, I can't do that because of my previous religion. I was excited about believing. I was eager to believe that gospel because that gospel was going to deliver me from my sins. And so I believed with all my heart, with thanksgiving and enthusiasm. So the idea that God reaches down here and jerks people out of their joy of sin and everything else, and they're saying, I don't want to be saved, don't take me. It's not like that at all. That's a straw man that people create to try to deny the truth of Scripture. God first, through the Spirit, convinces you it's true. And when you know it's true, that's what you want. It's that simple. And so God's the one that does it all. Let's look at Colossians, the, book, the passage we read this morning. So Paul says in Colossians 1.9, For this cause... Since the day we heard about you, Paul apparently had not been to that church or that fellowship yet. And so what had Paul heard about them? Well, if you go back to uh, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 4, he says what he heard. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 4, we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. So, he probably through Epaphras, who told Paul about their love for the saints and their faith in Christ and all of that, Paul had heard that, and the Spirit of God, Paul believed that the Spirit of God had convinced them of their sin, and they knew that Christ had died in their place, bearing their sins in his body, suffering their punishment. And so Paul had that confidence. He'd heard that about them. And then going on, if they had done all of that, they knew they had been saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. They knew that God had forgiven them all their trespasses. And they knew they were complete in him. And so for today, personal salvation through faith in the finished work of Christ is the initial prerequisite to know God better. There is no other way. Nobody can know God apart from the Spirit of God making it known and you believing the gospel of salvation for today. Then you now have un interrupted access to God by grace. That's the marvelous gospel of grace. And now we can have this interchange of dialogue. Prior to that, and a lot of people have been offended by this, because a lot of people believe they're saved by being in this totally depraved state. They don't believe that either, I guess, most of them. But being in this state that every imagination of their heart was continually evil, they don't believe that. They don't believe what the Word says. If they don't believe they were at enmity with God, they don't believe what the world says. But they believe that in that state, they get saved by them reaching first to God. Now they may say, oh, God gives me a, a hint, or God starts to work with me, and then I get saved by reaching to him. 
by making a decision or by choosing him, and then I get the full package. And again, I, I pleaded for anybody to show me that in the scriptures, to show me any place where the Apostle Paul says, make a decision today, or choose God today, or ask Jesus into your heart, or anything like that, you won't find it. What does Paul say we must do? One thing, believe. And so what I'm sharing with you today is that I believe that for us to believe, it has to come from God to us, convincing us of the truth. And we are, when we are convinced, that's the truth. That's what I want. I believe it. I desire it. I believe I'm going to hell. I sure don't want that. From what I've heard, I, I, you know, sitting in the bar, they say, well, we'll all be together having a great time down here partying. It's not going to be like that. And so I didn't want hell. I was convinced Christ was my only way. And I eagerly embraced and believed the gospel. And so Paul says, when we have heard of your faith in Jesus Christ, and having their salvation secured in Christ, Paul prays this for them now. We have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will. And I'm not that intelligent, I'm not that educated, I'm not that knowledgeable that I can go into all the philosophical arguments about what does it mean to know? You know, like man gets so caught up in his own wisdom, like the concept that God created everything out of nothing. Well, man in philosophy says there is nothing, and then there's really nothing. It, it, man can come up with every kind of, uh, of extension or anything to satisfy his own itching ears, his own nature, to do whatever he can to resist God. But none of us can truly resist the convicting work of the Spirit of God when he brings the truth of salvation to us. And so these had this secured, but now Paul's asking, how are they going to get this? They aren't going to earn it. They aren't going to necessarily study it or anything else. God is going to fill them with the knowledge of his will. And that word knowledge or know God is epigenosko, which means, gnosko means to know. Epigenosko means to know intimately or intricately, or to be closely and intimately involved with it. It is the idea of knowing it in its, in its intricacies, in its fullness. That's what it means to know, to have the knowledge of his will. It is with a, a, a special, in-depth, understanding. And so in Ephesians 1.15, Paul prays almost the same thing. In verse 15 of Ephesians chapter 1, for this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you. This is one of the things we should be praying about within our fellowship, giving thanks for one another. You know, we, we often give thanks for people that do good things to us, or people we like. But we should give thanks for every member of the body of Christ. We should give thanks not because of the way they behave or act, but because of God's grace. Giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, and here's what Paul's asking them. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. It's God that's got to do it. This is where faith comes in, and because of time, I'm going to sum it all up very quickly right now, rather than to finish this up. You can look at it on your own and 
if it raises any questions or anything, and I may touch on this next week as we continue. But to sum all this up, it really comes down to this. If you have trusted Christ as your Savior, if you know God has forgiven you all of your sin, if you know he has imputed the righteousness of Christ, his sinless son, onto your account, you're not righteous in yourself. You have the righteousness of Christ on your account that is sufficient so that God has been propitiated or satisfied. And now God is free to totally reveal himself, whatever he has for you, according to his sovereign purpose and will. Now God tells us we've been created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. Now I would challenge you somewhat facetiously to tell me what is God's good work for you tomorrow? How do you know what's going to happen tomorrow? We have plans, but we don't have any idea of what tomorrow is going to be. Or how about next week? So I submit to you today, rather than try to figure out God, rather than try to figure out what he's doing or anything else, I submit to you to simply trust God and walk by faith. Now we can go to the Word and find out things God tells us, the way we should live and everything. Then trust Him. If that's what you desire. If you don't desire it, trust Him. Lord, give me that. I don't even want it, but I know your will tells me that, that your Word tells me that this should be in my life. This is the way my life should be. I can't do it. Lord, I trust in you to do it. And then walk by faith. He's promised he will do it. But man wants to figure it out and calibrate it and give you three simple steps, four steps, or whatever it is, uh, the Roman road. And one of the experiences, I've shared this before, one of the experiences I had once was communicating the gospel, saying what the Bible said, to about a half a dozen male teachers one day, sitting like this in a classroom, and I had a chance to almost preach like I'm doing right now, probably for 15 minutes. And then it all broke up. And I sat there in my chair saying, boy, no, I really did a good job. I covered everything. I don't know what else I could have mentioned that would have been effective. I, I was just so pleased with myself. And I don't know that any one of them heard one thing I said. They heard the words. They had the knowledge of what was said, but they didn't have the spiritual knowledge. The Spirit of God, as far as I know, didn't illumine one of their hearts to anything I said. Now, that doesn't mean that it wouldn't happen yet. Some of them are still alive. One man waters and another man plants. But God gives the increase. And so should it be according to his will and purpose that he would use that later? But one thing I know, his word will never return on you and boy. It will accomplish that for which he's ordained it. So I didn't say it in vain. But whether they received it or not, who knows? And that's not our job. Our job is to just trust God and be his servant by faith. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, I pray that the truth of your word and what you would have us know would be impressed upon our minds and hearts by your spirit. And all the things that are wood, hay, and stubble that have been expressed would simply be ignored and not remembered. And so we simply commit this time to you, use it for your glory, and we'll praise you and thank you for all eternity.
for the riches of your grace and the salvation that is ours in your sinless Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in his name we pray. Amen.